Hey guys, how's it going? So, today I have an AK to show you, and this is a pretty unique AK, and I hope you guys will enjoy the video. There's not a lot on this gun, but I'll do my best to kind of go through it with you, and we'll all take a look together. But first, I'd like to thank a Patreon supporter of mine. His name's Cole, and he's helping out the channel, and I do appreciate it, man. And he requested that I show this gun, so hopefully all of you guys enjoy it. And for the other Patreon members who have requested I show certain guns, those videos are in the lineup. So if any of you out there would like to support me, I do have a Patreon account. The link's down in the description. And I do really appreciate everyone's help. And for the rest of you, I appreciate you guys watching too. So what I have here is a Chinese AK variant. Now specifically, this is the AKS762. What this particular one is, this is a pre-band semi-automatic import chambered in the standard 762 by 39 this gun is made in China imported as a polytech by KFS which is Kang's firearm specialty and they were located in Georgia and they still are actually located there they're just not able to import these AKs anymore due to several laws including the first ban on so-called assault rifles, which happened in 1989, and then the further ban by Bill Clinton through executive action in 1994, banning the import of all Chinese rifles as well as Chinese ammunition. So, take another look at this from this side, guys. And what this is basically known as is a Bakelite side folder. Now, a little bit of history about this gun. Like a lot of the um, AKs that we had imported, both pre-ban and post-ban, this gun definitely gets its pedigree from a true military rifle. The original version of this gun was actually manufactured in China at the same factory 416 that this gun was produced in. Let's see if we can get the roll mark to show up there. Factory 416. Now, this is... A model AKS 7.62 and it clearly states semi-automatic on the side of the receiver however so this is this specific gun was basically made for export to the United States for civilian purchase and that's how it got here right but there is actually a military variant of this gun and that would be basically the 56-2 so collectively the AKs are basically considered the Type 56 carbines. That's the general term that is going to encompass pretty much all of the Chinese AKs, right? So they started off with the milled variants, obviously went to the stamped variants. After that, you can find both fixed stocks, underfolding stocks, and as time progressed and they moved on to different variants, they ended up manufacturing these side folding stocks. Now, these may have been used in Chinese military service, although I've found no evidence of that. But I will say that China, besides their own standing army, obviously, also manufactured many of their AKs for export to other countries' militaries. And this specific variant is found to be used in the past, and from what I understand, still somewhat in the present day, in countries such as Sri Lanka, which is in Asia, and then the little European island country of Malta, right? Down there between Europe and Africa. And you can actually look up pictures and see troops training with and carrying rifles that basically look identical to this. With the only real exception of having the third pinhole to accommodate what many people call the full auto sear or the safety sear. So this gun has... A stamped receiver, a stamped sheet metal receiver. Now with this being a Chinese gun, this is the heavier like 1.6 millimeter stamped receiver. So it's substantially thicker than like your standard one millimeter AKM. And before I go any further, I've referred to this by its correct name that it's a Type 56 carbine variant. Meaning, you know, the rifle, the Type 56 rifle was obviously the SKS. And yes, we can call these AKs, and it's totally fine to call this an AK-47 if you want to. You could even call this an AKM, but it's actually kind of neither, and it's kind of both. 
So what happened is, is the Chinese originally, when they started making the AKs, they had help and aid from the Russians, both with access to prints, even advisors that came over to China and helped them set up their assembly lines and even helped them go ahead and, you know, facilitate the making of them, the understanding and general supervision, right? Well, when this first started, the China was on the mill variants, and that's the technology that Russia gave them, if you will, in the 1950s. Well, shortly thereafter that, what happened is, to make a long story short, like many communist countries, they got along, but then they kind of didn't get along. And China, you know, wasn't exactly, you know, doing what Russia wanted them to do. So Russia said, you know what, we're not going to help you anymore. So what China did is basically, since they started off making, you know, AK-47, more like type three variants, when they first started decided to make an AKM, they did the sheet metal receiver but they still kept many of the classic AK-47 milled features. And we're gonna to start to see those right away on this gun. Although it has a stamped receiver, it has the thick, heavy duty, non-ribbed dust cover, which is more of a classic AK-47, you know, milled type design. As we go a little further forward, we're gonna notice that the gas block does not have any bleed off vents for the excess gas, you know, but the gas tube is vented. Now this is also more of an AK-47 type feature. When we move forward a little bit, we are gonna notice that the sling attachment point is on the gas block rather than the traditional AKM where it would be on the front handguard retainer. So this is another AK-47 type, type feature. We're also gonna notice the barrel profile. The barrel profile on these Chinese AKs is heavier and thicker than a classic AKM, making it a lot more similar to an AK-47. Now, this gun here is a true pre-ban, meaning pre-1989 ban. So quick history lesson for you guys that are newer into the AK or imports period. So up until 1989, we could get guns imported from other countries as long as they were semi-automatic and assuming they were semi-automatic, they were good to go, right? Now, in 1989, George Bush, the first George Bush president, he said, well, I'm gonna ban importation of assault rifles. And those were his words. He couldn't have been more wrong because this is not an assault rifle. Now, it's fully automatic, select fire counterpart, which I've referred to that's used in military service in Malta, Sri Lanka, and other countries. That is correctly actually an assault rifle, guys. It meets the definition, something that shoots an intermediate round that is select fire between semi-auto and full auto. Well, after 1986, these types of guns were not allowed to be made in the United States. And you actually have to go all the way back to 1968, the Gun Control Act of 68. Before then, we could get imported machine guns. After 68, the importation of machine guns was also banned. And then in 86, the domestic production. So. With this gun certainly being imported after 68 and also after 1986, this is a semi-automatic gun. Well, unfortunately, like I said, due to the Republican president's gun control, these became banned in 1989. So what's the big deal? What makes a pre-89 ban different than all the rest or one you would have today? Well, I'll put it as simply as I can. Basically, they added an amendment to the Gun Control Act of 1968 called Section 922R. And what this states is if somebody's going to, it basically outlaws the importation of foreign, what they call assault rifles. Now, what makes it an assault rifle? There's a whole list of parts on the gun. And different guns, depending what they are, might have, you know, 12 parts, 15, 16 parts. It just depends. Because this doesn't just affect AKs. This affects all foreign rifles. Now, they basically said, look, if it's an import, it's banned. But the way that you could get around it is they could bring in the guns either that didn't have all of these evil features, things like bayonet lugs, threaded muzzles, pistol grips, folding stocks, you know, stuff like the shoulder thing that goes up. I think you guys know what I'm talking about. Detachable magazines that would hold, you know, over five rounds, ten rounds, different types of variations came out back then. So they said they couldn't be imported. So what they do is they would bring guns in 
and they would either leave them like in a sporter configuration, you know, the thumb hole stocks, etc., or people would deband them, and they would have to add, in the AK, most of the time, about six American parts. Now, after they added a certain amount of American parts, it was no longer considered a foreign rifle. All right, enough with the boring stuff. This gun, being a true pre-band, manufactured in 1987, the specific one, and brought into the country shortly thereafter, most likely 1987 or 1988, this gun is 100% Chinese. It was able to be brought into the country, 100% Chinese. It's allowed to be fully owned and possessed, as it is, with zero American parts on it. And it can be sold and transferred. This gun is basically grandfathered in over the old law and would be technically illegal for them to import today. But this one's good because it was brought in before 89. So as you can imagine, it makes these guns a little bit rare. There was only a certain amount of these guns brought in. Because if you remember in the 1980s, the AK was kind of a novel idea in the United States. A lot of people didn't really like the idea of a commie gun. And certainly the AR-15, which is still the case today, was reigning supreme. And that was the most desired weapon in America, which makes sense. So these guns kind of started coming in the country. Probably the first main purchases of AKs was actually the movie industry. And there's some early imports that are pre-bans, collectively known as movie guns. And they simply came into the country, usually purchased through California, importers in California, and they would serve as props for movies. And in a future video, I have one of those original movie guns, one of the very first guns to ever come in the U.S. And I'll do a video on that if you guys are interested. Let me know in the comments, by the way, guys. I have a fair amount of these old Chinese pre-bans and stuff. So if you guys are looking for more of this stuff, let me know. If you can't tell, I'm kind of an AK geek, so I don't mind doing videos on this. But this gun here was, again, brought in for just for civilian ownership in the United States very early. Looking at the serial number here, it started off with a PS87. So that basically tells me it came in, or was produced, rather, in 1987. Then the next serial number, or the number, is 762, which is normal. A lot of times you'll see that on these pre-bands where they'll incorporate the caliber in with the serial number or the model number. So this is that model AKS-762. AK and then S meaning semi-automatic, 762 for the caliber. Now the serial number, same thing, PS87762. And the serial number on this particular gun is in the 500 range. Nobody knows exactly for sure how many came into the United States. You could assume that it started with serial number one, but not necessarily. In fact, I have not seen a serial number of one of these Polytech AKS 762s down that low. I've never seen one that was below the three digits, to be honest. So these were brought in in the hundreds, not the thousands. Probably only a couple hundred of these guns were ever brought in over 30 years ago. And everything you see here, literally, besides the third pinhole, is pretty much historically accurate to the actual real deal military select fire machine guns that China was making to sell to the export market and to their allies, friends, or, or customers. Kind of a great area with China, whether anyone was really their friend or not. But you guys know what I'm saying. What I really like about these Chinese guns, especially the pre-bands, is the bluing on them. They have a very deep, dark bluing. All of the surfaces are very highly polished before the bluing, which results in a very high degree of fit and finish. I've always thought these old Chinese AKs were actually amongst the prettiest. Does it really matter if you're on the battlefield? Of course not. But if you're collecting the gun and just generally enjoying it, which is what I do with this gun, it sure is a beauty. Now, I mentioned right off the bat, Bakelite side folder. Well, it basically is what it says. So, the handguards. Unlike most of the Chinese AKs, which have the wood, normally the chew wood handguards, these have true phenolic resin, otherwise known as Bakelite. And I don't know if you can hear that. This is a hard, you know, fiberglass type, type substance, basically. And it may not technically be Bakelite, but look, that's what everyone in the collector world calls it. So we'll just call it Bakelite for all intents and purposes. So Bakelite handguards. Same thing. We have a Bakelite pistol grip. Again, that same hard material. This is definitely not a polymer, but a true, you know, old school Bakelite type. 
And then we go down to the stock. And this is a folding stock that has two Bakelite panels on it. And this stock is pretty cool because unlike the underfolding stock, which, hey, they look cool. Huge fan of underfolders. Coolness factor, oh yeah. But everyone that shot one knows they're not probably the most comfortable, right? But the trade-off is you get the compact rifle, right? For vehicle carry, firing it out of vehicles, inside of buildings, breaching doorways. There's a million reasons why it's nice to have a compact package, right? Well, this one, you don't really have to compromise too much. This is a sheet metal stamped buttstock. And it's actually quite comfortable. It fits into the shoulder well. I would note that there are grooves stamped in just to help it slide in on your, keep it from sliding on your shoulder a little bit. And where the cheek goes, the comb is just right. It's just the right height for me. I'm getting a perfect sight picture right now. And the area in which the cheek rests is kind of right on the edge of where the Bakelite meets the metal. And I find this to be much more pleasant to shoulder than the classic underfolder. And certainly more comfortable than the wire folding stocks. You know, like you would see on a Romanian PM model 90, something like that. This is probably the most comfortable of these metal type folding stocks. So, it's pretty cool. Now the stock, this gun has a special trunnion that's to accommodate basically this exact type of stock. And this gun is going to fold out and to the right. So there's a button on the top with knurling that we're going to push in. And then we're going to find it releases the hinge. And it's going to swivel all the way to the side. And it does lock up once it's folded. So there's no way this is going to swing away on you while you wish to have it in the compact position. So that's what the gun looks like with the stock folded. If you notice, it, there's a little bit of an angle here that angles down just in the right spot where we can still get our finger on the trigger guard. I mean, it's kind of a close fit. My trigger finger is basically touching the bottom of the stock, but when I put it in there, I'm actually able to fire and not any problem. Boy, that trigger is beautiful. I'll get to that in a second. I love the trigger on this gun. Like most Chinese pre-ban AKs. Or even the sporters as far as that goes. In other words, Chinese AKs that have the original Chinese trigger in them. So, that's what the gun looks like when it's folded. We can see this variety does have a dimple in the receiver for extra support in the magwell area. Most Chinese stamped type 56s do actually have the, um, the dimple. Now, some of them did not, especially some of them made for export, and I do plan on covering one of those guns in a later video. But for the most part, including this gun right here, its military counterpart does correctly have the stamped, you know, support gusset in there. So to deploy the stock back out, I'm going to simply push the same button here again. Just give it a little bit of outward pressure. Very fluid, by the way. No resistance at all. This stock, I don't know if you guys can see this, you can't hear any rubbing or grinding. It's just completely fluid. And I would note one more time, everything on this gun, the fit and finish is just literally impeccable. No burrs, no rough spots. The bluing, very nice. Very highly polished and finished metal. And as far as that goes, let's look at the rivet work on this gun. Again, this gun was riveted in China, brought over here exactly the way it looks today. The rivets are absolutely beautiful, which is kind of to be expected. The Chinese were always known for actually forming really good rivets and having a pretty high degree of fit and finish on these AKs. We're not noticing any of the clipped rivets. We don't see any smiley face rivets. We don't see any of the stuff that, I hate to say it, are kind of become commonplace on a lot of American AK builds. You know, made in China. When you buy something at the store, especially the Walmart Chinese junk, you think, well, that's crappy. It's Chinese made. Yeah, I agree. But with AKs, it's totally different. When it came to military arsenal production of weapons, the Chinese have actually never been known to cut corners and actually are considered by many to be one of the top, if not the top, manufacturers of the AK pattern rifles. 
Again, these guns are very robust. Tend to be a little heavier than most because certain things like the barrel profile, the extra thickness on the sheet metal receiver, things like that. There's a lot more steel in this gun than there is even a Russian, to be quite honest. Because these are kind of, you know, a half hybrid between an AK-47 and an AKM. You get kind of the, some of the old school features, some of the heavy duty quality, right? Now, speaking of features that are a little bit different on a Chinese AK, this, like all the rest of them, has a hooded front sight, which is rather unique for an AK. As you guys know, most of them have the open two ears that protect the front sight post. So this has the proper hooded. This gun is also equipped from the factory with a muzzle nut. Now look, many countries use muzzle nuts on their AK-47s. And by the time they went to AKMs, they would use the slant brake, or a lot of you call it the sugar scoop, right? Well, China, again, being more inspired by the AK-47 still, normally would make these guns with just a muzzle nut, just to protect the threads. And that's how they would actually fight with them in battle. And the pictures I've seen of the Sri Lankans and the Maltese, every picture I can find of troops carrying these rifles or performing drills with them, all do have the muzzle nut. So this is actually the proper way this gun would fight in service with simply no muzzle device at all. Which is kind of interesting because a lot of people go through and you know, pick out the best muzzle brake for their AK, which is awesome. I encourage you guys to do that. But if you look at the actual militaries that use this gun, many of them use a simple slant brake, or in this case, no muzzle device at all. Basically, the way I understand it, for a caliber with such you know such low recoil as a 7.62 by 39, because let's face it, as much as this is a great round, and I love it, and we all love it, this is not a full-powered rifle round. This is correctly an intermediate round that, of course, has more recoil than 5.56, but on the scope of things, very little recoil. And a trained soldier was able to keep this gun on plane and generally aimed in the right direction with no muzzle device whatsoever. So I just figured I'd go over that because a lot of people kind of had that question over the years, like, well, why is there just a muzzle nut on the gun? Well, in this case, this is a pre-ban. If you want an AK that you're going to modify and do stuff to, please, by all means, do it. But you definitely probably don't want to really modify a gun like this because to any collector, you're going to want it in original factory imported configuration, which is basically its military configuration, minus the fun switch, of course. And yeah, this wouldn't be something I would want to modify just because they're a little bit collectible per se. Here's the import mark on the bottom here. So this is KFS, Kang's Firearm Specialty, Atlanta, Georgia. And Mr. Kang was the one who was responsible for importing the Polytex into the United States. The other main importer would be probably Norinco. And the Norinco's are also great guns and I own several of those and I'm going to be talking about those in future videos too. But the main thing with the Polytex is these have always been considered kind of the upper echelon, right? So they imported famous AKs such as the Polytech Legend. They also imported other Polytechs such as, believe it or not, an M14, similar to, you know, the M1A. And a wide variety of different AKs and even SKSs. Now, Mr. Kang, from what I understand, he would specify when he was ordering rifles from China that he wanted them to be to a little bit higher degree of fit and finish, right? That he wanted basically top shelf, premium stuff where the bluing had to look just right everything had to be properly polished and he was willing to pay a little more money for that and in turn the polytex would always cost a little more back when you could buy these brand new you know at current you know import market value so you know it's up to you guys but a lot of people you know kind of prefer a polytech just because again you know coming through kfs these were kind of cream of the crop guns Mr. Kang, if there was a blemish or something that wasn't quite right, it generally didn't make it out of his warehouse into the public. So, And this was made at Factory 416, which is a Chinese military arsenal, as well as Factory 66, which I'm going to be talking about that more. By the way, people who always ask what this is, this is the Chinese arsenal 66. They were famous for putting them in triangles. And many AKs were made there. This one was made in Factory 416, 
which is one of the couple factories that Polytex would come out of. There's the 416. It's real faint, but it's right there. The other factory that Polytex would come out of was factory 386. So in general, what you're going to see is the milled guns that came out of, you know, um, that came through as Polytex through Kangs. Those were usually the 386, whereas the stamped variants would be factory 416. Speaking of a little bit earlier features, you'll see that even the mag release is of a milled, heavy-duty design, substantially thicker than the sheet metal counterpart that you would find on an AKM. Some of the Chinese guns had milled selectors. Now, on this one, being a later production gun, this has a stamped selector. And I would note one big difference besides the full auto part, which I've discussed already, that makes this gun a little bit different for export rather than, or for civilian export, I should say, rather than the military exports that China was making, is they put this little, they put this little selector stop here that is, if you notice, much, much higher than it normally is. And for those of you that are into the Chinese pre-bands, you'll know what I mean. For some reason, on any other civilian, you know, made for civilian guns, they always put this really high selector stop in here. So what that essentially does is keeps the selector at two positions. We'll see with the dust cover, with the selector act, acting as a dust cover in the up position, this is going to be safe, which is standard fare. But what I note is interesting. If you look at, they actually cut a notch here for fire. And you can go down to the fire position, which is curiously where the full auto position would be if this were a machine gun. So I know why they did it. They did it to basically, they were trying to prove to importers, right, to the ATF and whatnot, that look, this gun only has two positions. But it's kind of stupid if you think about it, that they made the position for safe actually where machine gun fire, full auto would be and down all the way down which i can't go any further because of this high selector stop that's where semi would be so if you're familiar with how the ak's manual of arms works if it's a machine gun you start off in safe it's meant to be a gross motor movements gun right you could just simply slam it all the way down to the bottom further than this will allow it to go now you're in semi-auto but they wanted the troops to make a conscientious decision to find that middle spot there which is where this gun stops at to put it in full auto so as with most militaries, they didn't always expect their troops to fire on full auto. In fact, most of the time, they actually preferred them to carry their gun in semi-auto. So they blocked where the semi-auto position would be and made it where the selector rides in the full auto position. Now, this is kind of a moot point. I'm just being very technical and very picky here. Do I wish they never did this? Yeah. But the problem is, this is how they all are. All the polytechs are like this, so you kind of deal with it. But it's funny that they forced you to put it in the full auto position. I think some of you AK guys will get a kick out of that. But it's all a moot point like I was getting at. Because this gun's semi-auto no matter what. Because it lacks several of the components necessary to even house the full auto parts. So for anyone out there watching it that's in doubt, this is a completely semi-auto. It's just cosmetically the fire position here for semi-auto is where full auto would normally be. So I have an original Chinese stamped magazine here when the chinese first started making their magazines they looked much like the russians because again the russians were the main influencer and they used to have a regular ribbed spine and they would just simply have usually a factory 66 mark well after the russians kind of left china and kind of got rid of their influence they developed what we normally call a chinese flatback so if you look at the back of this mag it's just simply lacking the hard 90 degree ridge and it just has a smoothed over piece of metal here that's acting as a support like a rib all the way down the back and I always kind of liked these they fit in the magazine pouches in and out actually much easier because they don't have the protruding spine that we're used to and same thing with these mags nice bluing on them typically a very high degree of fit and finish this mag is in very nice shape now this particular mag is a military type 56 carbine you know type 56 ak mag usually the ones that were brought in for import would say made in china on the bottom and specifically the polytech ones would have a chrome follower sorry i don't have a chrome follower mag with me today guys i have the accessories that originally came with this gun the chrome follower mags and the bayonet at home somewhere 
I've been looking for them for a little while now. Working so much, I haven't had much time to look for them at home is what it comes down to. And I thought instead of delaying this review, I'd just show it to you with a regular Chinese military mag. But when this gun was new, it did come with a red colored Bakelite handle and scabbard bayonet, which I'll show you guys in a later video once I find it. And it would come with, you know, made for import to the US mags that would say made in China on the bottom. But other than that, exactly the same mag as this with the flat back and the stamped construction. The mag inserts into this gun nicely. Of course, since I'm on camera, I fumbled it, but whatever. And like I was saying earlier, everything on this gun's Chinese. Don't have to worry about American parts, including the trigger. So what I've always loved about these Chinese guns is, first of all, the smoothness of the action. So I'm going to cycle this again for you. Just listen to how smooth this is. There's nothing on this trigger, like a Tapco. There's no sharp edges to make the carrier bind. Everything on this thing, it just feels like it's on ball bearings. I mean, perfectly smooth, no hitches, awesome. Now the trigger. Let me see if I can show this to you guys. Very light, very crisp. I mean, this trigger is very, very good. The reset of it, very crisp, audible, and then just a nice little teeny, just a teeny bit of creep, not much, just a little bit of slack, and then just a sharp wall. This trigger is definitely, definitely in the low poundage range. I mean, certainly I want to say less than five pounds, so, and I, I, I find the trigger to be very, very enjoyable, too. It has the original military style profile on the actual trigger engagement surface itself you know the trigger shoe here where your finger hits it oh let me think here what i'm missing on this gun i'm sure i'm missing a bunch of stuff but oh we'll look at the site we'll see that the site is graduated out to 800 meters if my camera will focus on it there we go 800 meters it has the letter d which we'll find is a very common marking on both Chinese Type 56 AKs as well as even the SKSs. Now, the very first SKSs would have the Russian type marking, but that's future videos that I'm going to have coming out any day now. Some of the very first Chinese SKSs. So if you guys are into those, keep a watch out on the channel and you're going to definitely see those too. One more little unique feature of this buttstock. So... If you guys are familiar, your normal wire folding stock or an underfolding stock, there's no provision for a cleaning kit, right? Because the wood stock, there's simply a hole board in the back with a spring-loaded trap door. So when you first look at this gun, you see that there doesn't appear to be provisions for a cleaning kit, but there actually is. So check this out. First, we're going to go on the top of the stock here. And we're going to see just a little hole with a little pin here. So you could take like a bullet tip, or I'm just going to use this little Allen wrench as a punch. Let's see if I can do this on camera. I'm just going to simply push down on this little pin. This is a spring-loaded pin. Let's see if I can get this to show up just right. And when I push down, it actually ejects, because this is under spring tension, our cleaning kit. So there is a space in between these Bakelite panels to house a special cleaning kit. And again, this is for military service. I'll emphasize one more time, barely anything on this gun is different than its original military counterpart. So it's a nice little blued finish. Again, even on this cleaning kit, the fit and finish is impeccable on it. But yeah, you've got your standard fare on here. You've got your jag, your cleaning brush, the little screwdriver type tool that can be used for adjusting your sights, etc. A pen punch. Everything's in there. And this is simply has a little spring-loaded detent that locks it into the stock. And there's a spring in the front that helps eject it out. So we're just simply going to take this kit, insert it through the rear of the rifle stock again. Make sure it's lined up where it's not catching on these two, you know, outer ribs here. The button should be on the top. And I just push it in, and I feel some spring resistance. And now this little keeper pin just popped back up. 
Now it's completely secure. There's literally no chance of you accidentally losing this cleaning kit. It clicks into place with a positive spring-loaded detent, and you're not going to get it out unless you conscientiously, you know, put a punch or a bullet tip in there to release it. Obviously, this receiver was made in China, considering how everything on this gun's made in China. But we can see right here, Polytech, Beijing, China. It features a chrome-lined, cold hammer-forged barrel. And typical with most of the Chinese guns like this, pretty much all of them I've ever seen, the barrels have this ribbing on them. And it actually, I don't know if you can hear me rub my fingernail against it. It almost reminds me of like a record player. They're very, very small, fine little grooves that are in the barrel, the outside of it. It's hard to pick up on camera, guys, but they're there. And this is just another little signature trademark of a... Chinese AK barrel, right? This one includes, of course, the original cleaning rod. This is a Chinese made sling that was included with the gun. They would usually give you a sling and then an oil bottle, owner's manual, magazines, and a bayonet. And I really do want to do a quick follow-up video later on this where I can show you guys the bayonet and all that too because they're pretty cool. But we can see the hammer in there. It has the case hardening, kind of like purplish look to it, which is pretty common on a on an original Chinese gun. So yeah, there you guys go. This is a very close, accurate representation of basically the 56-2 military Type 56 carbine. And there's very few of these in the country, and I'm proud to own this one, and I really do enjoy it. I've always thought there was something pretty cool about the Chinese Bakelite side folder and just kind of pre-ban AKs in general because it sucks. All the laws we have in the United States, you can't really own a proper country of origin AK. You have to compromise and pick so many U.S. parts and all these different things. But back before, 18, before 1989, you could pretty much get the gun exactly how it was issued to troops minus the full auto components. Which, don't get me wrong, that's BS too. <laughs> we should be able to have that. But with the laws that we've allowed ourselves to live under, this is about, about as close as you can get to a rather rare Chinese-made military variant. So hopefully all of you guys like this rifle, especially Cole. I hope you really like it, man. So if you guys have any further questions about this gun, anything I may have missed or whatever, let me know in the comments. If you guys are curious about more Chinese AKs, pre-bans, what we call ban era, post-bans, let me know. I'll show you another quick teaser here of another AK we could talk about if you guys want. A Chinese 56-1. Got a couple of these too that we can talk about if you guys are into the Chinese guns. Just let me know. Alright guys, I know it was a long video, but you don't see this gun very often, and I know, I know I've got some pretty high level <laughs> Mill Serpent AK geeks in the audience, so I thought I'd do a longer video for those of you that really like to take your time and learn about these guns. So, if you have ADD, I'm sorry this wasn't the video for you, I'll try to put out a shorter one next time. Alright guys, thanks for watching, and have a good one.